Well, thank you all for still being here. I saw you out getting your, your fog burn this afternoon, or fog tan, however it works with your skin. You know, I was just thinking that there's, this has been quite a week, and there's been a lot of very, there's been a lot of moments that I'm going to hold with me for the rest of my life, very memorable moments. Uh, Jordan was one of those things that I'm, I'm going to remember Jordan for the rest of my life. You cannot forget Jordan uh, doing the high jump up here like he did. It's, it's amazing. I, some, of, some of the testimonies, many of the testimonies and stories we heard from our missionaries this week have been just unforgettable, just a wonderful blessing to me. And of course, there was the most quotable moment of the week uh, you know, in spite of everything, we've, I've been up here hours talking to you. We've heard great testimonies and things. But, but the most quotable moment of the week was this morning when Joe asked Neil to, to share his novel idea about the offering. And he said, let's give money. So <laughs> I, I may forget everything I've ever said up here, but I will never forget that, you know. So, so this is, this is our last session together, looking at the Great Commission. You probably never guessed we could talk for six straight days on three verses, but yep, when you're seminary trained, you can do that. So, so let's listen together for the last time, and maybe after all we've been talking about, something new will spark in your mind as you listen. But the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus had arranged with them. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshiped him. But some of them were doubtful. But Jesus approached them and said, God has given me all authority in heaven and on earth, so go and lead people in every nation to become my followers by baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and by teaching them to follow everything I have commanded you. And know for certain, I am always going to be with you, even until the end of time. All right, so now I'd like us to go back 330 years before Jesus uttered these words to the city of Athens. A man named Epicurus has gathered together a small group of students to form a tight-knit community and learn about life from him while enjoying each other's presence in his garden. Now, you may not have heard the name Epicurus, but you've probably heard the name of the school of philosophy that he established, Epicureanism. Now, I don't know what picture comes to your mind when you hear the word Epicurean, but I tend to think of a large bowl with chocolate cake, ice cream, and dozens of different sugary toppings, you know, that kind of food that you love while you're eating it and start hating the fact that you ate it seconds after it's gone. I think of raw hedonistic pleasure. But while it's true that Epicurus said that the goal of life was to experience pleasure, it really had nothing to do with ice cream and chocolate. In fact, he lived a very frugal, self-disciplined life, and his students did exactly the same. Epicurus was what we call an atomistic materialist. He believed that the universe was made up of tiny, solid particles of different shapes called atoms. Now, these were very different from what physicists talk about today, but it was still amazing that someone could conceive of tiny particles like this being the basis for all of matter 2,300 years ago. And these so-called atoms were the building blocks of everything. And between the atoms, there was nothing but empty space. The atoms have always been around, and they will never cease to exist. And somehow, through some random process of pure chance, they merged to create everything we can see and touch. Uh, rocks, trees, puppies, butterflies, and people are the result of this accidental arrangement of these little atomic particles. Even, Epicurus said, our souls, which to him was like a different kind of body within our physical bodies. Even our souls, he said, were made up of atoms. And when we die, the atoms disperse, and our bodies break down, and we're finished. There's nothing to us before we were born and nothing after we die. Since 
There's no ultimate purpose to life, and life itself is just happenstance, then our chief aim, our only true purpose logically should to be to enjoy it while we have it. But that enjoyment should not entail gorging ourselves on Rocky Road ice cream because that kind of pleasure is too short-lived and often results in physical suffering in the form of a tummy ache afterwards, as does virtually every form of overindulgence. So for Epicurus, the best way to experience pleasure was to hold very low expectations and avoid any form of obligation beyond simple friendship. Marriage, he said, did little more than complicate life. You had to deal with inconvenient things like fidelity, in-laws, children. So forget marriage, he said. Religion made people feel guilty and deprived us of pleasure. How can you be happy if you're always worried about offending some god? Avoid religion. Seeking after wealth puts all kinds of unnecessary pressure on a person. So forget wealth. Learn to be satisfied with a bare minimum that you need to be comfortable and shun anything that makes you anxious. That's the real definition of pleasure in the Epicurean philosophy, contentment combined with a lack of anxiety. And Epicurus asserted the two greatest fears, the two greatest sources of anxiety were the fear of death and the fear of the gods. What happens to us after we die? Is it judgment? Is it punishment? Is it some kind of karma to pay us back for all the bad deeds we've done? It's because of this fear of the unknown that people make themselves miserable trying to undo the harm they've done and meet some kind of impossible divine standard. But Epicurus said that the cure for those fears was to realize that death is merely the dissolution of the person. There's no such thing as an afterlife or judgment after we're dead, we're gone. There's no sensation, no awareness, no anything. And lack of sensation or awareness is really nothing to be frightened of. So why be anxious? If you're not afraid of death, you're better equipped to experience pleasure in the here and now. And the gods, he said, who, by the way, are also made up of atoms of a different sort, well, they don't give a hoot about people or what they do. We're nothing to them. They know how to live a perfect, non-anxious life, so they have absolutely no connection with any sort of people who would only create hassles for them anyway. They live off somewhere where they don't have to deal with us, and we don't have to deal with them. So don't think about the gods. Prayers do nothing. They're not listening. Sacrifices do nothing. They don't need or expect anything from us. If the gods have no connection or concern about us, they are nothing to worry about. We're on our own, so let's just enjoy life and not waste our time worrying about such things. You know, some of our country's founding fathers were what we call deists, which is actually kind of a modified version of Epicureanism. Deists believed that there was a God who created this universe, but he set it up to be able to run on its own, and then he headed off to a timeshare in Orlando or someplace and didn't leave a forwarding address. Right? We're on our own, so we have to figure out how we're going to make this work. The big difference between, say, Epicurus and Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist, was that Epicurus was all about experiencing pleasure, and Thomas Jefferson... We're all about using our intellects and sweat to make progress, to make a better future. If humanity just put its collective mind to it, we can accomplish anything, they thought. Don't waste time asking an absent God to help. We're all we've got, and we're all that we need. That's the attitude we inherited from our Enlightenment forebears. Human reason, human effort, human cooperation... If we just think hard enough and work hard enough and collaborate well enough, life will get better and better. I have two things to say about this kind of philosophy. And the first thing is that we actually owe a lot to it. Most of our advances in technology and medicine have come about as a result of this can-do uh, attitude, this kind of work ethic. Humanity is capable 
of amazing things. But the second thing I want to say about it is, it's a total lie. It's a distortion. Epicurus believed that the goal of life was pleasure. The deists believed that the goal of life was progress. But in neither case did they provide anyone with a reason to be here. And if the deists were right, and the only way forward is to rely on others who are every bit as flawed as I am, then we are in big trouble. Yes, we've come up with things like cars and computers, and we can put robots on Mars and create vaccines, but life for people is no less anxiety-producing than it was centuries ago. In fact, along with all of these blessings and things we produce, we've also produced plenty of curses for the Earth. Weapons of destruction that share the same technological foundation as many of these positive accomplishments I've just mentioned. Pollution and global warming that stem from those great accomplishments. The fact that the world has gotten smaller not only allows us to create multinational corporations or send goods around the globe, but also allows a contagious virus to spread from one small community to every country on Earth in a few short months. Our great achievements haven't done a thing to bring peace to the earth. People still die of starvation, more because of our messed up politics than because of the lack of resources. And even those who are famous or fabulously wealthy suffer from depression or die young from alcohol and drug abuse. No, the Epicureans and deists were dead wrong. Left to our own devices, People do as much harm as good. Life with an absent God is life without hope or purpose. Brothers and sisters, we are in dire need of some good news. And so Matthew begins his gospel by giving it to us. Behold, he says, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. We read this text every Christmas. We sing carols about Emmanuel. We give the name to an amazingly wonderful seminary that needs many more students from the Pacific Northwest. I, I had to get my plug in at the end of the week. I'm sorry. We hear the translation, God with us, and it evokes feelings of reassurance and contentment, but it's important that we hear it as the first recipients did. You see, Matthew is quoting the book of Isaiah here written at a time when Jerusalem was about to be attacked by the northern kingdom. Now, this isn't just any enemy. It's their own cousins coming after them. And it looks hopeless to King Ahaz, but God sends Isaiah to him with this sign of hope and the assurance that he has not forgotten nor forsaken his people. Emmanuel, God is there with them. He will protect them. And he did. But still, they were a rebellious lot. And eventually, they were conquered by the Babylonians, then lived under the domination of the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Seleucids, then the Ptolemies, and finally, Rome. And for centuries, the feeling was that God, the God who had created them and rescued them from Egypt, had finally grown tired of their unfaithfulness and had abandoned them for good. But you know, it wasn't true. A child was born. Emmanuel, God was still with them. But for what? Was it to defeat Rome and gain independence, as many of them were praying for? Was it to give them nice feelings because there was someone there who could share their sufferings? Or was it for something more? Was there a greater purpose behind his presence? Was it perhaps, as Isaiah had said before, so that they could be a light to the nations so that salvation would reach to the ends of the earth. The birth of Jesus in Matthew foretold the promise of salvation, but it also foretold the promise of God's presence in mission. When the angel told Joseph to take Mary as his wife because the child which she was to bear was conceived by the Holy Spirit, he said, name him Jesus, Yehoshua, God saves because he will save his people from their sins, he said. Now, our tendency from our Christian viewpoint is to think something like, the Jewish people had gone astray from their faith, 
And Jesus came to die to make atonement for their sins and give them eternal life in heaven. But I, know, I think in this case, there's far more to that promise. Because the point of sin, the definition of sin, is that it is missing the mark. It's directing one's life toward the wrong purposes. Israel, you see, was to be a priestly nation that pointed the rest of the world to the one true God. They had a special calling among all the nations of the earth. They had a mission to be a blessing to the nations by leading them back to their creator. Through their faithfulness in worship and witness to the mighty deeds of God, other nations would be drawn to them and their God. But we're told throughout the Old Testament, even with people like Abraham and Moses and David and the prophets calling them back to that purpose, they repeatedly turned away. They denied their calling. They followed other gods. They adopted the corrupt ways of the other nations. They worshiped pieces of wood and rock. They became no different from any other nation. Israel's greatest sin was to deny their calling to be a light to the nations. But God has ways of getting around our unfaithfulness. Israel would still live up to its calling, but in a single representative, a helpless Jewish child born in doubtful circumstances and forced into exile. Not exactly your typical hero. But this child would grow to be a man who would fulfill God's calling for the entire nation. The main way that Jesus saved his people from their sins was by taking their abandoned mission and purpose into himself, even to the point of death. In Jesus, God was with Israel to do what they would not do apart from him. And so just as Matthew began his gospel with the promise that God is with us, he makes it the very last note of the entire gospel. It's as if by beginning and ending on that note, Matthew was asking us to see all that happened between chapter 1 and the last verse as giving content to that very promise. So look at the life of Jesus. Look at what he taught. Look at how he treated others. See how his words and actions aligned. See his priorities and values. See how he had compassion on the marginalized and corrected the arrogant. See his faithfulness and steadfastness. See how he forgave people. See how he called everyone around him to be different, to lead a different kind of life, a better kind of life, drawing on God's strength and sustenance. See his willingness to lay down his life for others. This is Emmanuel, God with us, calling us to be that light in a dark world. We're not like the Epicureans or the Deists. Our God is not and never has been absent or apathetic to our existence, but the Great Commission shows us that there's more to this promise than warm fuzzies. He's not just a God who hangs around to sympathize with our troubles. God is a God of mission. We are a sent people. We have good news to tell and demonstrate to the world, but we must never forget whose mission it is and what role we play in it. So, with the assurance that Jesus, though resurrected and ascended, remains with us as we live as his missionary people, I'd like to recap some of what we've been learning and mention some implications of what it means to live out this great commission, living as those under God's reign and the authority of Christ and making disciples by baptizing others and teaching them to do what he commanded. And I'm going to do this by borrowing a few points from Christopher Wright's book, The Mission of God's People. So, as people participating in God's great mission to reconcile the world to him, what does that say about us? One, we are people who know the story we are a part of. Yes, we know the stories of the Bible, of creation, the flood, the exodus, and all that followed. But more than that, we see the overarching flow of that grand narrative. God created the world and all that is in it, including us to live in a fulfilling, dependent relationship with him, but it went astray. Sin and death distorted the beauty of creation and led people to follow false gods and false goals. 
God chose Abraham and his descendants to be people who would live as those under his reign and invite the nations to come back to him, but they proved unfaithful. But God was not. He was not going to be deterred from his restoration project. He sent his son to fulfill the mission of Israel as a light to the nations. And now with Christ's victory over sin and death and with his authority and empowering presence, the church continues his mission. And this is our story now. This is who we are. Of all the Gospels, Matthew is the one most closely connected to the Old Testament that most clearly communicates how Jesus has fulfilled the mission of God's people, Israel. And when we read of his authority and what it means to be his disciples, we know the story behind the Great Commission. And now it remains to live out that story both at home and as we are sent to other people groups around the world. We are calling people to more than raising their hand at a camp meeting. We are calling them to be followers, to be participants in what God has been doing and will continue to do in the world. That's what it means to know the story that we're a part of. Two, we are people who are a blessing to the nations. If you go back to the very first verse of Matthew, you'll read these words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then before telling us any details about the birth of Jesus, Matthew records the generations of Christ's ancestors, starting with Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And on it goes until we come all the way down to Joseph, the father of Jesus. So why did he start with Abraham? Why not start with Adam? Why not David? Because if we're going to understand the direction this gospel is taking us and why we end up being called to make disciples of the nation, we need to go back to Abraham and God's promise to him that he would bless him and his descendants and that they would then become a blessing to the nations. And how might this blessing come about? By pointing the nations to the one true God. Israel's relationship with the other nations was always on shaky grounds. They always seemed to be fighting them or accommodating themselves to them or being enslaved by them. Instead of being that unique God-centered group of people, they gave into being enticed to live and act like the other nations. How could they be a blessing when they themselves had lost sight of God? But God's promise and call to Abraham was still in effect, even if ignored by his grandkids. And the Great Commission calls us back to it Paul makes this clear in Romans 4 because there can be no greater blessing than to follow Jesus and become a part of what God is now doing to extend that righteousness, that right relationship with him to all peoples everywhere. Three, we are people who walk in God's way. We are called to be disciples who make disciples. This means we live as Jesus lived and call others to do the same. We spoke yesterday of how we go about teaching others to do what Jesus commanded, how it means that we teach them as he did through word and deed by walking alongside of them, through living the life of discipleship and showing others what it looks like and calling them to join us. The way of God is not manipulative. It does not force itself on others. It invites. It is not fearful, but stands boldly, though humbly for truth. God's way according to the teachings of Jesus, is the way of forgiveness and compassion. It sees people as people who are lost and need direction. It pays attention to those who are marginalized. It starts within our own hearts and works itself out to behaviors. God's way doesn't look like the world's way. And those who are caught up in the world's way might not understand it. But in the end, God's way is what we were designed for. We can only be who we were created to be by walking in God's way. Four, we are a people who are redeemed for redemptive living. Now, I used Christopher Wright's words, redeemed and redemptive here, with some hesitation, not because they're bad words, but because they've become a part of our religious vocabulary that rolls off the tongue, but seldom into the mind. 
But when in scripture we come across the word redeem, it should always call us back to the Exodus and how God freed his people from their enslavement. You know, there are two ways to redeem someone from slavery, just two. The first is you can purchase them away from their owner. Or the second one is you can conquer the owner and release the slaves. And it's pretty clear which of these alternatives God made use of in the Exodus. And in the resurrection of Jesus, we see that same kind of victory over the forces of evil and darkness and sin and death, freeing us to live the victorious lives of discipleship so that we too can help others become free. We are redeemed. We now enjoy the benefits of Christ's victory over the powers that enslaved us and continue to enslave the world around us. But with Christ's authority, we are not only freed from something, we are free to live boldly as people of his kingdom, extending that offer of freedom to the rest of the world. Five, we are people who represent God to the world. I mentioned in Monday's message that we were, when we were talking about uh, being part of God's kingdom, that we've been called to be his emissaries, representatives who go out with the authority of the one who sent us into the world. And we've touched on how we need to represent God not only with our words, but in our behavior and how we treat others. Something we need to realize about our fellow travelers on this globe is that people are looking and aching for something more than what they have. They're looking for a sense of meaning and purpose. They're looking for the strength to live up to their own ideals. They're looking for acceptance and love. They're looking for ways to deal with their pain and anxiety. And so they try things and they latch onto groups or simply find ways of escaping or dulling their senses so that they don't have to think about all of this. And one reason why they have not found a better way is that the church has not always done a great job at representing God to the world. We haven't always looked that much like Jesus in our interactions with others. But looking like Jesus is pretty much the definition of discipleship. And a church that is intentional about following that path will find that people will respond to their invitation. We have what they're seeking, even if they don't yet realize what it is. Six, we are people who send and are sent. We spoke on Tuesday about the word go and how in this context, it's actually the opposite of the word stay. It means that we do not sit in our church buildings waiting for others to somehow find their ways to our door. It means that our times of worship and Bible study and sermon listening need to result in our going out into the community around us and sending those whom God has gifted and called into other communities, in other places, to testify what God has done. It means being a Christian in the public square, not an in-your-face, turn-or-burn kind of person, but a person who loves and serves and gives freely and openly acknowledges that transforming power of Christ in your life. God sent Jesus to us. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 3 calls Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. And that word apostle means somebody sent with a job to do. And as Jesus was sent, so he has sent us. And so we are to send others. It may be next door. It may be across town. It may be to the inner city or the jungles of Papua New Guinea or the poverty-stricken settlements around Nairobi. Just like the church in Antioch, who sent out Paul and Barnabas, we cannot hang on to our brightest and most gifted because of how they bless us. We send them because we know that these are the ones who will bless others. And finally, number seven, we are people who praise and pray. When the disciples came to that Galilean mountain to encounter the risen Christ, the first thing they did was fall to the ground and worship. That's the first step to true discipleship. That's what comes before and undergirds everything else we do in making disciples. We remain connected to the source who has promised to be with us until the end of time. 
We recognize God for who he is. We give praise to Jesus for what he has done for us in the world. We pray for help as we are sent and sending others. We understand that we are powerless on our own, but that we serve a mighty God, a God who has a mission. And our mission will not be complete until all the people from every tongue and nation are joining us in that worship. Let's pray. Oh God, you are the glorious one who has sought us out and now sends us out. But beyond all else, you are the one who is always with us, guiding, comforting, prodding, teaching, leading, empowering. We rest in your presence and lift our hands and voices in praise. In the name of Jesus, the conquering, risen Lord, we pray. Amen.